Hello, everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel, Homeopathy Super Sessions by Dr. Jagos. Today, I'll be doing with you the short history of Hanneman's life and his contributions. This full video will be divided into four parts. So the first part I will be telling you all today. And one more important announcement is there. If you're a student of homeopathy, you can please download this Homeo ED app, which is free and you can go through it. It is quite useful for, uh, for, for, for study purposes also. It is available on the Android so far. So you can go to the Google Play, Play Store and you can download this app and you can uh, have a look at it. So let's see something about the, con the introduction. Dr. Samuel Christian Frederick Hanneman, the founder of homeopathy, was a true genius, born on the midnight of 10th of April, 1755 at Pisen in Saxony. So he was born on the midnight of the 10th of April, 1755 at Pisen in Saxony. His father was a porcelain painter who did not believe in letting his son stay long at school. So his father, who was a porcelain painter, what believed in not letting his son stay long at school. So what did he do? When Hanneman was five years old, his father had a habit of giving, giving his son what he called thinking lessons. So for that, what, what his father had done when he used to go for work, he used to give his child, that is the, the so-called Dr. Hanneman, some problem to solve. And when he used to come back in, and he used to lock the door. And when he used to come back in the evening, he used to open the door and his son used to try and find out the correct answer. So in this way, the, his son's logical thinking process was developed right from a very young age of five years of age. The, but the baptismal register of Mesin contains the following record. Christian Frederick Samuel Hanneman born on the morning of the 11th of April, 1755, baptized the 13th day of April of the same year by M. Jaghans, Father Christian Gottfried Hanneman, painter, mother Joanna Christian, born Spice. So, since Dr. Hanneman was born on the midnight of 10th of April, 1755, however, the baptismal register at Missing, it contains the date 11th of April in the morning. So, but internationally, the 10th of April is considered the birth of Dr. Hanneman. But please remember that the baptismal register showed it at the, on the 11th of April. The town register gives 11th and the celebration at Vicin in, in 1855 on the 100th birthday, 11th was the date selected. So, on the 100th birthday of Dr. Hanneman, the town register gives the date 11th. So the celebration was done on the 11th, hence the date was selected. But the date of a birth of Hanneman has been usually given as 10th and not the 11th of April, 1755. So please remember that the controversy is there since he was born on the midnight of of the, uh, of the 10th of April. So whether it, was, whether it was 10th April or whether it was 11th April. So the right answer is he was born on the 10th of April, but however, the town register gives it as the 11th of April. So please remember that the Viva, they may ask you this question. The families, Hanneman's family, this is also important because in the Viva, they may ask you these questions also. So the father's name, Christian Gottfried Hanneman, Mother's name, Joanna Christiana Hanneman, born Spice. Brother's name, August Hanneman. Sister's name, Charlotte and Mina. So you have to remember the father's name, brother's name, mother's name, and sister's name. All this is important in the Viva examination. So one brother by the name of August Hanneman, two sisters by the name of Charlotte and Mina. His first wife, Joanna Henry T. Leopoldine Kuchler, daughter of Gottfried Henry Kuchler, married at Dessau in December 1782, died at Kothen 31st March 1830. Second wife's name, 
Mademoiselle Mary Melanie de Havilly, daughter of the painter of Savoy, married at Cothen, January 28, 1835, died at Paris, 27th May, 1878, and no children. So, again, it's important that Vaiva, they'll ask you what was Hanneman's first wife's name, what was Hanneman's second wife's name, and how many children did he have from the first wife, how many children he had from the second wife. So, from the first wife, he had 11 children, two sons and nine daughters. So the names are Henry T. Daughter, born in 1783, Fedrich, the son, 1786 born, Wilhelmina, daughter, 1788 born, Emily, 1789 born, Caroline, 1791 born. Now the sixth was a twins, Fedrick, daughter, in 1795, and one stillborn female child. So the seventh is considered as the stillborn female child. Ernst, the son, in 1798, Eleanor, daughter, 1803, Charlotte, 1805, and Louise, 1806. Now there's no need to remember all the names of all the children at least if you can remember two, three names, that is more than enough. So they will ask you from his first, in the Viva, from his first wife, how many children Hanneman had? So you will answer, he had totally 11 children from the first wife to her two sons and nine daughters, and out of which the sixth delivery was a twin, one was stillborn. Okay, so they may also ask you which delivery was a twin and <clears throat> and uh, and did both the children survive or not? So you must say no. One was a one was a stillborn. Hmm? So this is also they ask you in the viva. Then <clears throat> so about the Hanneman's life. So you must know his mother's name, father's name, how many brothers sisters he had, how many children from the first wife and from the second wife, and names of few children at least you remember. Now, education. <clears throat> Dr. Hanneman's education started from his early childhood days when his mother and father taught him to read and write whilst playing. So when the child, small Dr. Hanneman was playing, his mother and father taught them, taught him how to read and write. He all, his father always implanted the idea to act and to live without pretense or show. And always stressed on never be a passive listener or teacher which is a noteworthy percept. So his father always implanted good ideas in his mind and important ones were to act and live without pretense or show. That, that means live with a very simple life, do not show off and always stressed on never to be a passive listener teacher, always be curious, always ask questions. For several years, Hanneman studied at the town school of Bissin in Saxony. So for many, many years, He's, he had his education in the town school of Wiesen in Saxony. At the age of six years, he attended the princess school of Wiesen, where he came across the rector, Magister Muller, who was a teacher of many ancient languages. So this is also important for the Vaiva. They'll ask you, what was the name of the school Dr. Hanneman attended? So you must say the princess school. And who was the name of the rector? Or, or who was he influenced by during the school? So you must say he was influenced by the rector, Magister Muller. Why? Because the rector, Magister Muller, taught him many, many languages. So at the age of 22, he knew 11 foreign languages. That's a quite an achievement. At the age of 22, he knew 11 foreign languages. So he was a master of Greek, Latin, English, Italian, Hebrew, Syrian, Arabic, Spanish, German, Shatlik, and French. In 1755, his father gave him permission to study at the University of Leipzig. In 1779, he got his MD degree from the University of Erlangen. So again, in the Viva, they'll ask you, at the age of 22, how many foreign languages are you? Name a few. So you must know that also. And in which year he got the MD degree? 1779, from the University of Erlangen. Now, important again, conversion to homeopathy. You can either, they'll ask you in the Viva, what or how, I mean, how did Dr. Hanneman convert them to homeopathy? Or you may get a full question or a short question in the examination also. 
Dr. Hanneman's conversion to homeopathy. So Dr. Hanneman was practicing allopathy, but soon became a homeopathic physician as a result of the allopathic treatment were disappointing. So since he was an allopathic physician, he wasn't very much convinced about the efficacy of treatment or the result. So he found the results very disappointing. And hence, his inclination towards homeopathy or he was curious to know something more about certain things which was written in Cullian's Matra Medica, which made him think and develop or rather discover the homeopathic system of medicine. Let us see later on what it is about. In 1784, he stopped his medical practice as he was frustrated the methods used to treat patients which he found crude and cruel. So, Dr. Hanneman, right from the beginning, wasn't very much impressed by the allopathic system because the results were not very good. They were very cruel and they were very crude. He noted that the patients did not get cured but complained of the same symptoms with increased intensity. Thus, he took up the hobby of translation. So, <clears throat> the patients did not get cured but each time they came back and each time they came back, the symptoms were with increased intensity. So as you all know, very crude methods were used during Hanneman's time to treat the patients like leaching, branding, mini sections and administration of mixtures. So you can see these are very, very crude methods which were used and each of these methods had their own side effects. So hence, Dr. Hanneman wasn't very convinced and he also took up the hobby of translation. <clears throat> Dr. Cullin was the authority on the subject of Materia Medica. He was an experienced lecture, lecturer, a talented chemist, and a brilliant and popular teacher in Edinburgh. He published his first edition of his book in London in 1773, the second edition in 1789, and it was this edition Hanneman used to translate from English to German. So this is an important point in Hanneman's life, conversion to homeopathy, that while converting Cullin's Materia Medica, from English to German, he came across a sentence. So let us see further about it. In 1790, when he was translating Collins Materia Medica, that is a treatise of Materia Medica, volume two, Cullen devoted 20 pages to the cortex peruvian, that is a peruvian bark, giving his cerebratic uses in the treatment of intermittent and remittent fevers. So in the year 1790, volume number two, page, page number, 108, he came across the Peruvian bark, which was useful in the treatment of intermittent and remittent fevers. He felt dissatisfied at the author's explanation of the action of Sincona bark in the treatment of ague, or that is the malarial fever. So he, he wasn't very convinced about the author's explanation about the cortex Peruvian or the Peruvian bark or the Sincona bark in the treatment of ague, that is known as malarial fever. It stated that because of the bitter and astringent properties of cinchona bark, it produced ague fever. So it stated that because cinchona bark had its bitter and astringent properties, it produced ague fever. Now let us see what Hanneman wrote in the following footnote. By combining the strongest bitters and the strongest astringent, one can obtain a compound which in small doses possesses much more of these properties than the bark and yet not specific for fever, will ever come of such a compound. The, this the author Cullen should have, ought to be have accounted for. This will perhaps not so easily be discovered for explain to us the action in the absence of the Sigona principle. So let us explain, let me explain to this in short. He said that this statement that Sigona bark, because of its bitter and astringent properties, it cured, acute, uh, it cured the acute fever. But Dr. Hanneman said that there were many other substances which were more bitter and more astringent than the Sincona bark, but they did not produce ague fever. So this the author should have accounted for. So this made him think, this sentence made him think why Cullin had written this, so he started experimenting. Let me explain to you this again. By combining the strongest bitters and the strongest astringents, 
So Dr. Hanneman wrote that if you, if you combine the strongest bitters and the strongest astringent, one can obtain a compound in small doses, possesses much more than these properties than the bark. So if you combine the strongest bitter and the strongest astringent, you can obtain the compound, which when given in small doses, has much more properties than the cinchona bark. And yet, no specific for fever. And yet, it is not specific for fever. Will ever come off such a compound. This the author Cullen ought to have accounted for. So as I, as I just told you that there were many other substances more bitter and more astringent than cinchona bark, but they did not produce acute fever. So this the author Cullen should have accounted for. This will perhaps not so easily be discovered for explained to us the action in the absence of the cinchona principle. So he said that this will perhaps not so be easily be discovered for explained to us the action in the absence of the cinchona principle. So. If the Sincona principle was not known, this would not, this would not have been discovered. So Dr. Hanneman further says, the other bitter substances include aconite, ignitia, arsenic, strong coffee, and pepper. So these are the other uh, bitter substances which are more bitter and more astringent than the peribin bark, like aconite, ignitia, arsenic, strong coffee, and pepper. He thus experimented by taking four drams, that is 30 cc of the tincture twice a day. So what did he do? He took the, per the Peruvian bark or the Sincona bark, four drams, that is 30 cc of the tincture twice a day. And to his surprise, he found out that it produced in him all symptoms of acute. If he repeated the drug, the symptoms appear, and he stopped the drug, the symptoms disappear. So it is very simple. As long as he took the drug, or as long as he took the tincture twice a day, the symptoms appeared of acute fever. The moment he stopped it, the symptoms disappeared. This was followed by a deep study of a number of drugs on different healthy individuals. So what did he do? He still wasn't very convinced. So he started proving the cinchona bark on other people by giving uh, 30 cc twice a day to many other people who are healthy. So whom did he give it to? He gave it to his family members, his friends, and his faithful disciples, which helped him in the proving. So whoever was the, were his disciples and his family members and friends, he started experimenting on them. This task of experiment continued nearly for six years and the result was the same. That is, whenever substance was taken in material doses, it would make a healthy person sick and produce certain symptoms. The same drug in minute doses could make a sick person well, provided the symptoms were the same. So, therefore, he says that the same, uh, the substance uh, the substance was taken in material dose would make a healthy person sick and produce certain symptoms. So basically, whatever substance can produce a disease, the same substance can also cure the disease. The same drug in minute doses could make a sick person well, provided the symptoms were the same. Finally, in the year 1796, he published an essay, an essay on the new principles for certain the curative power drugs and some examination of the previous principles. This essay, for the first time, explained the law of similars, which promised order in the chaotic field of medicine. So as you all know, medicine was chaotic because all the treatment was given on a hypothetical basis. Nothing was proved. Only theories, conject false conjectures and false ideas were there that this prob probability, this remedy could be used to treat such and such a disease. So there was totally chaos. So the law of similar promised order in the chaotic field of medicine. So that's all. So in the second part, we will see some more of the contributions, what books he wrote and so on and so forth. Thank you so much.